young adults. It's Pastor Alex here. I'm the campus pastor for our Christ Fellowship West Kendall campus. And I'm just so glad to be able to be with you guys today as we look at God's word and continue our series, A Psalm for Every Situation. We're looking at how God's word applies to our life. And yes, our life in every situation. And so today we're going to jump right in. We are in Psalm 51 and I'm going to read verses three and four for you. It says this, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, only you, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you so much for your word, and we pray that you would speak to us, Lord. How comforting it is to know that you are in every situation of our life, that there's not a moment that we are outside of your love and your grace. And God, there's not a moment that you're not extending your love towards us to to call us into a deeper relationship with you. So I pray that you would speak through your word today and Lord, that you would impact our lives and bring us into a full maturity in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, hey, as we look at this psalm, it reminded me of a story uh, of my really teaching experience before I became a pastor at Christ Fellowship. Some of you may know this, but I worked for Christ Fellowship Academy, which is uh, really uh, our, our school arm of our, of our church where we minister to kids from, from preschool all the way through to fifth grade. And in my uh, former life, before being a pastor here at CF, um, I worked at the school as a PE teacher. And that was an amazing gig. I mean, playing dodgeball, basketball with kids, playing football, looking like an all-star athlete when you're playing against kids who are like 10 years old, you know? Uh, but I remember that the hardest part of that job was teaching PE to kindergartners. And I say it's the hardest part because if you ever try to just get kindergartners to stand in line for a moment, I mean, it's a real task. And so not only did I have to line them up and walk them out to the PE field, but I would have to teach them how to play games. And so as you're taking a kindergarten class through how to play a game, you have to explain all the rules nice and slow and over and over again. And here's what was evident, that if the kids did not listen to the rules and did not obey those rules, what would happen is the class would quickly become chaotic. There would be division as they begin to argue with one another. And we would waste our entire PE time just trying to follow the rules. On the contrary, a successful PE class for that kindergarten class would be that all the kids listened to the rules, then followed them and obeyed those rules, and it led to unity, uh, a successful PE class where they ultimately had fun and they enjoyed themselves. So here's what I knew. It didn't matter how much they wanted to play the game, unless the class responded with obedience to the rules, they would not be able to enjoy the full benefits of their class time. I tell you that story because the truth is that we try to make our own rules in our relationship with God. What do I mean by that? Well, God says that there's one way that we ought to do something and then we try to do it our own way. And then we wonder why things are chaotic, (laughs) there's division, um, really, and why we're not ultimately fulfilled in our relationship with God. And that leads me to my main point for you today. And it's this, if you're taking notes, write this down. How we respond to our sin deeply affects our relationship with God. How we respond to our sin deeply affects our relationship with God. See, all of us sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And and, and that's something that we know. But just because we all sin doesn't mean that we all respond to our sin the same way. And what I want you to know today, young adults, is that there is a right way to respond to our sin and there's a wrong way. And so you might be saying, well, what's the right way and what's the wrong way? How can I tell the difference? And that's exactly what we're going to discover today as we go to God's word. And so for those taking notes, I want you to write this down as big number one. That worldly shame causes spiritual separation from God. When we respond to to, to our sin in a worldly way, it ultimately leads to us being separate from the God who loves us so much and wants to be close to us. Let's turn to another verse in Psalms. This is Psalm 44, 15. The psalmist writes this, All day long my disgrace is before me and my shame has covered my face. See, what we know here is that the psalmist is no stranger to shame. He has had enough experience with sin and with God to know God's standard and and enough experience with sin to know what the experience after sin looks like, to know the depth of the effects of sin. And so for this reason, the psalmist languishes in his shame, right? He he sits and he dwells in that shame because he knows that he has missed the mark. It says, all day long, my disgrace is before me. 
and shame has covered my face. And so not only does he know how, how deep his sin is, but he knows the pain of the fact that he offended the God who loves him and made him in his image and wants to have a relationship with him. And so because of that shame, although he knows God, he chooses in his shame to hide from God, to distance himself from God. You know, if that sounds familiar, it's because it is. Humanity has responded to sin in this way since the beginning of creation. Look at Genesis chapter 3. You know these people, Adam and Eve. It says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now listen to this part. It says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig trees together, leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. And here it is. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. See, they had this relationship with God where they would walk with God. Adam would walk with his creator. An intimate relationship, a close relationship. But because of Adam's sin now, his disobedience, he chose it upon himself that the proper response to being in sin would be to separate himself from God, to hide from the presence of God. Look at God's response. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. See, since the, the first act of rebellion in the garden, our relationship with God has been fractured by sin. The moment that sin was introduced into the world, a great divide was introduced between man and God. And because of our sin, even our perception of God was distorted. See, whereas before we walked with God in the garden at peace, after sin, we hid from God in fear. You see, I think if Adam and Eve knew then what we know now, that maybe in the moments immediately following their sin, their disobedience, they may have drawn near to God for forgiveness, but because of worldly shame, a shame that is based on our own sinful nature, they withdrew from the presence of God. Adam jumped to the conclusion that because of what he had done, he could no longer be in communion with God and resorted to hiding from his creator. I think of another popular character in the Bible that we know, a man named Judas Iscariot. Look at Matthew 27. This is after he betrays Jesus. It says, Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is it to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the piece of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and he hanged himself. See, Judas was so overwhelmed with the sin, the shame, the guilt that came with his betrayal of Jesus that he allowed that uh, shame to lead him into despair, forgetting all the ways that Jesus had already proved that he was in control and his mind was consumed with the lie that there was no turning back to God. See, the truth is, while many of us won't go as far as what Judas did because of our shame, I think many of us commit a relational suicide because of our shame. In other words, in our sinful shame, we take God's place as judge and juror over ourselves and we condemn ourselves for what we've done. We punish ourselves because deep down we don't believe that what Jesus did on the cross for us is actually enough. And in doing so, we rob the cross of its power over our lives and we undermine the work that Jesus himself said is finished on the cross. When we condemn ourselves, when we dwell in that and we forget how much God loves us, the only place that that leads us to is a spiritually dark place where we choose to dwell outside of the presence of God, outside of communion with God, and we deny his ability to restore our lives and our relationship with him. See, here's what I want you to know that Jesus already restored your relationship with him. The Bible says that while you were still a sinner, he died for you. There is not a moment in our life of sin where God's desire for us is to be separate from him. And Jesus proved that through his work on the cross. 
I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 10, and it's a long passage. But the author of Hebrews is trying to show uh, the, the, the Jewish believers now that, that the ways of the Old Testament were completed by the work of Jesus. In, in, in verses 1 uh, through 8, it talks about how in the law that priests would have to do blood sacrifices for the sins of the people day after day. Right, Because today people would sin and so today the priest would have to offer sacrifices. But then the morning would come and what would people do again? They would sin and so the, the next day the priest would have to offer sacrifices again. And what the author of Hebrews tells us is that there was never an end to the needed sacrifices as long as the priest wasn't Jesus. Let's pick up in verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 10. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are according to the law. And then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. This is Jesus. Verse 10. And by that, by the work of Jesus, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 11 says, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he, Jesus, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Young adults, be encouraged today that Jesus paid your debt of sin in full on the cross. There's not a moment in your life where you have to hide from God. There's not a moment in your life where God wants you to beat yourself up and destroy yourself and, and talk bad about yourself. There's not a moment in your life where God's desire for you is to be discouraged and to be in despair. There's not a moment where God's desire for you is that you should feel like you should quit on your life. At the cross of Calvary, God turned his face from his own son so that he would never have to turn his face from you. So we know this. The worldly shame leads to separation from God. When we beat ourselves up and when we condemn ourselves, it just distances our relationship with God. So how can we respond to our sin in a way that leads us closer to God? Well, I want you to write this down as big number two. Godly conviction creates spiritual intimacy with God. See, while worldly shame creates separation, godly conviction creates spiritual intimacy, closeness, a, a, a tight relationship with God. Let's go back to our verse that we started with. In, in verse three, it says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. The psalmist, he says, look, I know that my sin is exposed he says, against you, only you have I sinned and have done what is evil in your sight so that you might be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So still the psalmist is saying, I know that I sinned. I sinned against you, God. I'm not gonna cover it up. I'm not gonna pretend I didn't do it. And I'm not gonna pretend that I did it to somebody else. I, I sinned against you and, and you are blameless in your judgment. He says in verse five, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. See, the, the psalmist acknowledges that he's been a sinner from the start, that there's nothing in him that is worthy of a relationship with God. But look what he says in verse six. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. See, in verse three, we see David saying, I know my transgressions are ever before me. He's admitting his mistakes, which is the first step with getting right with God. He doesn't make excuses, but he, he, he admits them head on. He faces his sin head on. But what David does is he doesn't just stop at admitting he has sinned. He takes it a step further. He, he understands that feeling convicted is not about feeling guilt. It's an invitation to get closer to God. In verse 6, he, he, he admits that God wants honesty from him, not pretense. God wants honesty from David, not guilt. And the openness to say that God wants what's best for me. He wants me to be honest. He wants me to confess to him. That openness helps David reconnect with his loving God. And so that's what we need to know, that godly conviction leads us to God rather than away from him. When we admit our wrongs directly to God, 
We rely more on God's love and his grace. See, guilt, shame, it's a conversation with ourselves. I'm a bad person. I've done this. I could never do better. But conviction is a conversation with God. You expect better from me. You can help me change. You have a hope and a future. You have a perfect plan. And so instead of, of being turned away from God by our guilt and shame, God calls us through conviction to be turned towards him, to repent from that which is not good for us and go towards our loving father in relationship with him. And so now we know the purpose of conviction, the purpose of conviction. When you have that feeling that you know you ought to do better as a Christian, that feeling, uh, we know that it's good and it pulls us closer to God. Where does that feeling, where does that conviction come from? Well, I want to share with you a few ways, five ways that we can have uh, conviction uh, that leads us closer to God. The first way that God introduces conviction into our life is through the introduction of the Holy Spirit. The primary, that's the primary way God's spirit lives inside of us. And Jesus says in John 16, 8, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so the Holy Spirit is the one that prompts our conscience to, to bring awareness to our wrongdoing and, and, and lead us to change and seek forgiveness from God. Not only does conviction come from the Holy Spirit, but it comes from Scripture. And that's why it's so important to be in the word of God. If we want to know what God deems right and what God deems wrong, you have to know his word because ignorance is not bliss. Reading and studying God's word illuminates the areas in our life where we need to change, where we fall short. And verses in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 remind us that all scripture is God breathed and it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness. And so when we encounter God's word, it reveals to us sin that we might not even know is sin until we've read his word. And that rebuke, that challenge in his word, it challenges us to, to, to change. And so conviction comes by the Holy Spirit. Conviction comes by reading God's word. And conviction comes through prayer. In those moments of prayer, when we call out to God and we ask him to show us the areas that we need to change, God answers that prayer. Look at the psalmist, right, in, one, in, in Psalm 139. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. This is a plea from the psalmist that God would reveal to David himself the ways that he has fallen short. And so I encourage you, spend quiet time with God. Our prayer life shouldn't just look like, thank you, God, for our meals. Thank you, God, for our blessings. Hey, God, help me with this. But we should spend time every day with God, asking God, hey, what area, what thoughts am I having? What am I dealing with, uh, Lord, that I need to surrender to you? What do I need to give up? And what do I need to say sorry about? And, and God reveals that to us during our time of prayer. Now, this one, this next way that God uh, brings conviction into our life, hey, this one's a little bit tricky because God brings conviction to our life through fellow believers, and it's hard, it's hard when a brother or a sister calls out something in our life as sin. But just because it's hard, if it's in God's word, they're right. And so we have to really uh, allow other brothers and sisters in Christ into our lives to help us see our sins. And rather than respond uh, by, by running away from what they're saying or getting upset, we have to be thankful for the way that they speak into our life because they are doing us a great benefit we see uh, God's word in Proverbs 27, 17 says what? It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And none of us here want to be dull. We never want to be dull in our thinking of God's word. We never want to be unuseful to the kingdom of God. So that's why it's important that we allow mature believers in our life to call us out on ways that we can grow better. Because ultimately, a, a better, a stronger group of believers is a stronger church and is the gospel on mission. And so we have to allow people to speak into our life. But one of the ways, the hardest way, uh, I think, that we experience conviction is through the consequences of our sin. See, because whether we like it or not, and even if we're saved, a sin has consequences, right? Right? 
Uh, when you become a believer in Jesus, it's not that, hey, I'm going to take away every consequence in your life. The ultimate consequence, your eternal salvation, yes, that is handled at the cross. Jesus promises that anybody who calls on him, that they, they will experience that eternal salvation. But life continues past the moment that you receive Jesus. Amen? And so as we walk this walk, when we fall into sin, I want you to know there are very real consequences for our sin. And so God uses those consequences, those experiences where we disobey him and we experience the fruit of that disobey, dis, uh, disobeying. God uses that to teach us and to convict us. When we face the fallout of our choices, it leads us to recognize that, hey, we need to change and ultimately we seek God's help. And so these are some of the ways that God introduces conviction into our life. But all in all, know this, that God's conviction is not meant to lead you into guilt, into despair and into shame, but rather to bring you back into a healthy relationship with him. It's important for us to recognize our sin. We're not supposed to go aimlessly sinning. The Bible says, should we sin more so that grace may abound? Absolutely not. We are not to abuse God's grace, but we're also not to convict ourselves we're called not to punish ourselves because in doing so, we rob the cross of its power. So know this. If you're here today, if you're watching this today and you do not have a relationship with God, if you've never called upon the name of Jesus, well then God's primary agent for conviction, the Holy Spirit does not live inside of you. In our flesh, we're only able to experience guilt and shame. In our flesh, we cannot experience godly conviction. Without a relationship with Jesus, every time you sin, the only thing that you will feel is guilt or shame or numbness. And all of those things lead you away from God. But when you have a relationship with Jesus, God sends his Holy Spirit. The Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you as a believer. And that spirit is the one that when you sin, calls you back home to the Father. So if you're here today and you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, if you've never confessed that you believe in what he did on the cross, that it was payment for your sins and that he rose again on the third day, overcoming his own death and ultimately overcoming our death for all who believe in him. If you've never believed that today and you're here today, I want to invite you. I want to invite you to take all that guilt and shame that you've experienced for every wrong thing that you've done in your life and lay it at the feet of Jesus because you've been carrying it around for far too long. And I want you to know today that Jesus loves you, that in his word, he says that he will carry that burden for you and that he says that anybody who calls on his name will be saved. That's written in Romans 10, 13. And so I invite you wherever you're watching this from to do that. Call upon the name of the Lord. And let him take that brokenness, that shame and that guilt and give you a fresh life. And for those that do know him, know that his mercies are new every morning. And that's something that we can count on. Hey, if you've never made that, that, that if you've never said that prayer, you've never made the decision to ask Jesus into your life, I want to lead you through a prayer right now. It's not the words that save you. You don't have to pray it exactly as I do. Uh, you can pray it in your own words or you can repeat after me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, I thank you so much. Lord, I thank you for what you've done on the cross for my sins. I believe that Jesus is your son. Lord, that you sent him to save me, to save the world. And Lord, that he, he died on the cross as payment for my sin and that he rose again. And I ask Jesus to be the savior of my life. I ask you to save me from eternal uh, damnation. Lord, call me into a saving relationship with you. And forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, if you made that decision today, we want to know about it. You can go to cfmommy.org slash connect and let us know so we can give you a free Bible. But young adults, be encouraged today that God loves you, that he has a plan for your life and that he has a word for you in every situation. God bless you guys. See you later.